forces can do more than just change the motion of something. In fact, what a force can do is it can stretch or compress an object as well. It can physically change the shape and size of something that is compressible. A spring is a really simple system that we can look at these effects on. Of course, there's more to life than springs, but this is the simplest thing that we can show. So if we were interested on what a force does to something like a spring, you'd need to set up something like this. It's a spring that is held vertically and we have some of these slotted masses and we can hang these on the spring and see how it responds to that. So the more of these we add, the more stretch we should see here. So the independent variable is the weight and the dependent variable is how much it has stretched. Now, how we measure that stretch is slightly complicated. We must take a series of measurements about this spring here. We must know how long the spring is originally. And so we'd use a ruler clamped next to it to work out how long the spring is to start with. And then when we put it under a load like this and the string has stretched, we need to take a new measurement of the length of the spring. We're going to define then this quantity called the extension. An extension is defined as the new length minus the original length. And that tells us just how much more the spring has stretched by. And as we add more and more to this, what you'll see is we could measure that first one, and then we could measure the second extension with two newtons, and then the extension with three newtons, and on and on and on. And I would always try to measure from the same point on the spring and bring my eye level with the spring to take those measurements. After I've done this, I would want to plot my data on a graph. So what graph should we draw? Well, let's draw some axes to start with. And then there's my y axis, this could be my x axis, put some little divisions on here. Now Something that's quite confusing to people is about the convention and what you plot on which axis. You see, there's this convention in science that you always plot the independent variable here and the dependent variable there. So you are in control of the thing that's on this axis and how the system responds to your changes is what you plot on that axis. Except here. The the graph that we're drawing here predates that convention. In fact, most of physics does. Uh, what we do here is we plot it on the axes in a way that makes it most useful to us. So what we're going to do is we're going to plot, in this case, the force on the y-axis, always on this axis. The force in newtons. And on this axis, we're going to put the extension in meters. And remember, the extension is found by the new length minus the original length. And an important thing is, as you add one newton each time, 100 grams at a time, one newton, that you're not trying to work out you're not subtracting one measurement from the last measurement, you're subtracting one measurement from the first measurement, always relative to the first measurement, and that will give you the extension. Now, it's very unlikely that we're going to have one newton producing one metre of extension, because one newton is not a lot of force, and one metre of extension is a huge amount of extension. So, if I was to put this as 0.05, 5, 5 centimetres, 0.10 10 centimetres, 0.15, this is just some made-up scale. 
And you would have to set a scale here that was relevant to the experiment that you were doing. And the force here, we could do one newtons, two newtons, three, four, five, six. If you've included the newtons and axes, you don't need to put it on your scale, okay? On both. Now, what you would find is perhaps that you would, at one newton, uh, say on your first 100 grams, you've got five centimetre extension, fair enough. And then when you added another one, you got a uh, 10 centimetre extension. And then another one here, and on and on and on. And you wouldn't draw a bar chart here because this is not discrete. This is discrete data, it's not continuous. Anyway, we would have a graph that looks like this, made up of more data points as well. And you could draw a line of best fit through it. The, the more force you add to this spring, the more it stretches. Kind of obvious, isn't it? More force, more stretch. Now, there was a scientist called Robert Hooke, and he looked at this and he realised that there was something really significant going on here. And he called it Hooke's Law. And what he suggested was that there was a linear relationship between the two. They were directly proportional. He went as far as saying that the force was equal to some number multiplied by the extension. And the extension x, um, he put in the formula there, but he thought that the number here is going to be different for each spring. And so he wrote in k as a bit of a placeholder, and he thought, well, I'll figure out what k is later. Now we now know that k, we now call k the spring constant spring constant. And unlike the other quantities that appear in this formula, which can take any values, the spring constant is always the same number for a given spring. So for the apparatus that we just looked at, k in this equation would always be the same. And then we would change f, k stays the same, so x has to change. It means if we double f, then we're also going to see that x increases by the same proportion. So spring constant and the units of that are newtons per metre. Now, if I look at this, I have a force and I have extension on this axis. The gradient of a graph is the rise over the run. It's the y divided by the x. The gradient in this case is going to be equal to the force divided by the extension. And what we can see from that formula there is that the spring constant is equal to the force, which in this experiment was the weight acting downwards, because weight is a force, divided by the extension. Oh, look at that! Who'd have thought it? That if that is equal to the gradient, and the same thing is equal to the spring constant, then the gradient and the spring constant would actually be the same thing. So the gradient of this graph tells us the spring constant. So we can find it, we can find what that number is that links the force and the extension. The gradient is the spring constant. So let's work out what the gradient is for our big large triangle here and so pick a nice round number let's, let's go here we draw a big triangle onto it bigger the better not a little one because that's not very accurate is it we want a big one and what we need to do is we need to read off the axes just how tall this triangle is and just how far across this triangle is so we know this triangle is oh this triangle is about 3.6 high so it's 3.6 here, and it's zero down here. So we're going to know that the difference of 3.6 minus zero, so the, the force applied is 3.6 newtons. And how much extension did we get? 0.2, so we got 0.2. So the extension that we got was 20 centimetres, 0.2. So my gradient, which is the force divided by the extension, would be 3.6 divided by 
2, um, and we would use a calculator. If I can find a calculator. Okay. 3.6 divided by 0.2, I said about 18. Ha! <laughs> it was 18! Okay, so K, the spring constant in this case, is equal to 18 newtons per metre. It means if I want to stretch this one metre, I've got to apply 18 newtons. There we go. And so that is what the spring constant actually is on this graph. But I think you need to understand the spring constant a little bit more than this. It's not just a case of it's the gradient of the graph, it's the constant of portionality between these two variables. No, 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 no. It's how stiff the spring is. If it has a high spring constant, it's really stiff. And if it has a low spring constant, it's really not stiff at all. And so you've got to kind of picture what the spring constant means. You're expecting a high spring constant of something that doesn't give very much, and a low spring constant of something that gives really loads. Now, uh, interestingly here, there's something else that we can work out from this graph. And that is, uh, what happens if we overload the spring? Let's take a look. Now, as I add more and more load to this spring, you can see the extension is increasing. But what I find, and what Hook found, was that as I add more, it will extend. But if I then take them off again, I actually find that it will return to those values I previously recorded. Up right until the point where if I take off all of the weights that the spring returns to its original dimensions. We describe this as elastic behaviour. It has been stretched and it's gone back again. It's elastic. But watch what happens if I overstretch it. Now this is quite dangerous. It's quite fun as well. So we add all these weights. And uh, I'm gonna just, just randomly, let's add a whole load more. Woo! Okay, oh, danger time. I'm scared really scared. That was supposed to happen. But look what's happened to the spring. Look what happened, folks. Look, can you see? The spring does not look like it did before. The spring has permanently deformed. I can't make it go back to how it was before. Overloading the spring has caused it to deform. This is not elastic behaviour. This is known as plastic behaviour, strangely enough. Um, it has permanently deformed. It will not return to its original dimensions now. It's just going to have to go in the bin. <laughs> so what in the heckity heck just happened? Well, I'll tell you now. If we were plotting it like this, we added more and more. But then what we started to find was that adding more changed the shape of the graph. That it started out and it was proportional all the way to about here, but then it curved over at the top and then probably snapped. So we have this point here, the point where it stopped acting elastically. And we call that the elastic limit. Here, it stopped behaving itself and it started to do something else. It started to deform. And what happened when it deforms is it will not return to original size or dimensions. Return to original dimensions. Now up until that point, it was following Hooke's law. So, what is Hooke's law? Hooke's law states that force is proportional to extension until the elastic limit is reached.
which means that you stretch it. The more you stretch it, the more force you apply, the more it stretches, obviously, but it will always go back to its original size. But if you wouldn't reach that elastic limit, you're done for. It's never going to go back. You have deformed your spring and it is no longer following Hooke's law. Now there's one more part of this that we need to talk about. I'm going to have to create a bit of space so I can put it on the board. Bear with me, folks. Springs can be a store of energy. When we did the energy topic, we mentioned how springs the, uh, are one of the energy stores, the elastic uh, potential energy stored in a spring. Well, there is a spring inside this um, ballistic pendulum. And here's a metal ball and we pop it in the barrel and what we do is we pull this trigger back to this point here compressing the spring i've now stored some energy into this spring and when i release it it's going to fire that ball into this target over here Woo! look how far it pushed this up when it was hit by the ball. Now I just want you to observe what happens if we store more energy into it. We're gonna put the ball in like this and we're gonna pull this back, not to the first one, not to the second. Let's go all the way, shall we? All the way. Okay, okay. I'm gonna step back because I'm really scared. Whoa! Okay, did you see? It pushed it up much further the second time. There was more energy in the ball. And why was that? Well, because I pulled the spring back further. The more I'd compressed, and the more, if it was a different experiment, I'd extended the spring, the more energy there would be in it to be released. It actually turns out that the area under this graph is a representation of just how much energy has been stored in the spring. Because this is a triangle, uh, you can see that it would be a half force times the extension would give you the area. But a better way of expressing that formula for the energy stored in the spring, either compressed or stretched, is this. The energy and we give it a small subscript for E, remember, is equal to a half kx squared. Now this is the formula that we saw when we were talking about the energy stores, but now it makes more sense because we understand what K means. K is the spring constant. So the higher the K means you've got a stiffer spring, it means there's more energy going to be stored in it when it's compressed. And if it was a lower K, then it's not very stiff and you're not going to store as much energy in it. It depends on how stiff the spring is and how much you compress it, but only those two things. So you can see that K, the spring constant, which is different for every single spring, is actually really important in understanding not only the behaviour of the spring, how stiff it might be, but also in the amount of energy that that spring can store.